Es un gran eh, placer para mí estar acá en esta reunión y presentar eh, a nuestro distinguido visitante, el profesor James uh, Robinson, de Harvard University. Eh, el profesor Robinson es un destacado economista con eh, gran reconocimiento internacional por su importante contribución al análisis económico a través de, una, de su profusa investigación y publicaciones de al menos un centenar de libros de alto impacto y de una gran cantidad de, de artículos en, en journals eh, académicos. Sus eh, principales eh, intereses de investigación se centran en el desarrollo económico y la política eh, comparada en un enfoque de largo plazo, con una concentración particular en América Latina y el África subsahariana. Actualmente está llevando a cabo investigaciones en la República Democrática del Congo, Sierra Leona, Haití y Colombia, donde ha enseñado durante muchos años, en este último país, en Colombia obviamente, eh, durante el verano en la Universidad de los Andes en Bogotá. Eh, el profesor Robinson es David Florence Professor of Government de la Universidad de Harvard y profesor asociado del Instituto de Ciencias Sociales Cuantitativas y del Centro Weatherhead para Asuntos Internacionales de la misma universidad. Estudió economía en, el, en la London School of Economics, la Universidad de Warwick eh, y la Universidad de Yale. Anteriormente enseñó en el Departamento de Economía de la Universidad de Melbourne, la Universidad del Sur de California y antes de trasladarse a Harvard fue profesor en el Departamento de Economía y Ciencias Políticas en la Universidad de California en Berkeley. Para nuestra facultad es un verdadero honor tener a un profesor de tanto prestigio y renombre internacional aquí con nosotros hoy día. Uh, agradecemos su buena predisposición para acompañarnos e ilustrarnos con eh, su conferencia. La exposición que nos hará hoy se sustenta en la teoría expuesta en uno de sus libros más recientes y más reconocidos, escrito junto al destacado economista de MIT, Darren Asimoglu, Why Nations Fail, y que dio cuenta del origen del poder, la pobreza y la riqueza, y trata de explicar por qué algunos países son pobres mientras que otros han logrado desarrollarse eh, satisfactoriamente. En este contexto, el profesor Robinson hará un análisis de la realidad chilena, y de cómo ha sido y qué ha significado nuestro progreso económico. Eh, Professor Robinson, we are uh, honored to have you here with us today, and uh, we are very thankful for uh, taking this time to uh, talk to you. Uh, please uh, come to the podium to uh, give us your lecture. Uh, okay. Uh, oof, should I stand up here? Uh, voy, a, voy a hablar en inglés, desafortunadamente. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be uh, here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about my book uh, with Daron Ashimolu. It's called Why Nations Fail. Uh, ¿Por qué fracasan los países? The, the, the Spanish said that they couldn't translate nations into naciones because if you publish a book with that title in Spain, everyone thinks it's about the Basque country. <laughs> so they, had, they couldn't use naciones anyway. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the book, the general thesis in my book, and then I'm going to try to apply it uh, to Chile. So I was given the task of talking about Chile, even though I'm very uh, sort of un unqualified to do so. Uh, 
So, so I'm just going to try to talk about some hypotheses about the Chilean uh, development path and how that fits into the, the theory in our book. So, 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 so let me just start talking about the book and the general uh, theory. So the, 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 the theory that we have in the book is very simple and rather than uh, motivate it by talking about some sort of concepts or terminology, well, what, I, what I usually do is start with a story, uh, a story, and uh, since we're in Chile, or since we're in America, uh, Latin America, uh, the story is about the economic and political history of the Americas, so, so perhaps it's particularly appropriate to motivate the theory. So I'll talk for 10 minutes about the economic and political history of the Americas, and then I'll abstract from that discussion uh, the kind of key concepts of the book, and then I'll try to talk about uh, how Chile fits or doesn't fit into the general sort of picture of uh, historical development in uh, Latin America. So the book, uh, the book is really about, it's called Why Nations Fail, but it's just really trying to propose a, a way of thinking about what drives comparative economic development both in the world today and historically. So we're interested in trying to explain the differences between poor and rich countries today, but we're also very interested in the, 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 in the book in kind of the historical processes that created inequality in the modern world. So the book is sort of very historical in its focus also. And so, so let me start with a historical story about political and economic development in the Americas and use that as a way to motivate uh, everything. And I think you know, the Americas, the history of the Americas has been very important in, in the last 10 or 15 years in economics, in economic history, economic development, as a, because it's, it's, it generates a lot of puzzles. And uh, so it's, 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 it's got a lot of people focusing on these topics that I'm going to talk about, a lot of academics. So why talk about the Americas? Well, I think the Americas are very interesting because if you go back historically at the time of the conquest of the Americas, of course, uh, it would be very difficult, I think, to predict uh, how the Americas would look today. If you thought about the Americas at the time of the conquest when Columbus came to the Americas, and uh, you asked yourself, looking forward, how, what would we predict which parts of the Americas would be economically successful, which parts would be unsuccessful? It would be very difficult to predict how the world actually turned out, that Canada or the United States, which were very, seen as very marginal, uninteresting places at the time of the conquest of the Americas, or the southern cone of Latin America, would be much richer and more prosperous than Central America or Andean Bolivia, because that was where all the wealth and sophistication was at the time, that the Mexicas or, you know, the empire of the Incas was much more advanced technologically, politically, in terms of, you know, organization. The Incas had public goods, they built roads, they recorded huge amounts of information on quipus, on knotted strings, even though they didn't have writing. You know, this, they were much more advanced technologically than people in the southern cone of Latin America or North America or Canada. So, in fact, the pattern of prosperity and technological development that you see today is an enormous reversal of what happened at the time of the conquest. And I think the most plausible candidate, you know, which is the argument I'm going to develop for thinking about what created this reversal is the different way that colonial societies got organized. So let me talk a little bit about different ways in which colonial societies got organized. This is a going far back into history, but what we try to do in the first chapter is make this argument, but then show how that had this enormous enduring impact on the different development paths in the Americas, and I'm going to give you some flavor of the argument about how that past persisted and into the modern world. So, 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 what was it about these differential organization of colonial societies that was critical for explaining the subsequent development of the Americas and which explains why North America or even the southern cone of Latin America became much more prosperous than Central America or Andean South America? Well, 
I'm going to motivate that with a story too. One of my favorite stories about the conquest of the Americas is the conquest of, uh, well, the founding of Buenos Aires. So when Buenos Aires was first founded in the 1530s by Spaniards, they came uh, and they called the estuary the, the Rio de la Plata because they found uh, silver. And they thought, oh, silver, this is interesting. Let's found a city here. But it turned out that the silver came far from far to the west from the Inca Empire. There was actually no silver uh, in what's now the Pampa or Buenos Aires. And the local indigenous people, uh, the Caruas uh, the, the, and, and, the, the, and the, the Charuas and the Carandi, were, were very backward technologically, organizationally. There were very few of them. They weren't organized into sort of states or, 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 or kind of centralized political structures, and they didn't want to have anything much to do with the Spanish, to trade with them, and the Spanish were, there was, no, they, 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 they was very nothing on which to base an economy. So they sent out expeditions looking for silver, looking for other peoples, and they discovered up the Paraná River the Guarani in what's now Paraguay. So they abandoned Buenos Aires en masse, they all left, they abandoned the city, and they moved to Paraguay and took over the Guarani. So nowadays we tend to think of Buenos Aires as being a somewhat more attractive place to live than Asuncion. But in those days it was the other way around because the dense populations of indigenous people were in Paraguay, not in the Pampa. So the Spanish abandoned Buenos Aires. It had to be refounded 40 years later and they moved to take over the Guarani. And when they took over the Guarani, they started constructing a type of society based on the exploitation of indigenous people. The first thing they did was they introduced this, the encomienda. And the encomienda was a particular type of what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna call an economic institution. It was a set of rules which heavily influenced the way economic incentives and economic opportunities functioned in a colonial Paraguay. And it was basically a system for exploiting indigenous people, extracting labor and rents for the benefit of the conquistadors. Now, what happened in the United States? I'm going to embellish this a bit, but let's reflect on the difference between Paraguay and the United States. Well, the English started colonizing uh, Virginia in 1607. They founded the Jamestown colony. Uh, by that time, of course, the Spanish had already taken, the Spanish and the Portuguese had already taken the attractive parts of the, of the Americas, and the English were left with this marginal, kind of rocky, uninteresting thing in which we now call the United States. Uh, they came with a model of how to colonize the Americas. Now you're thinking, okay, he started talking about the Spanish, now he's talking about the English, he's going to tell us about the common law and how the English brought liberty and, you know, how, you know, there was a... They, no, 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 no. This is not what happened. The English had a model of how you colonize the Americas and their model was explicitly derived from the Spanish, from Cortes, from Pizarro, from Jimenez de Quesada. And the model said, when you colonize the Americas, the first thing you do is you capture the local indigenous chief. Because once you capture the local indigenous chief, that gives you huge leverage over indigenous society. It's what Pizarro did, what Cortes did with Montezuma, Atahualpa, what uh, Jimenez de Quesada did. So the English said, okay, right, now first of all we identify the local indigenous leader, we capture him, and then you know, things are going to be great. Now, there was a local indigenous leader, there was a gentleman called Wahun Sunakok, but Wahun Sunakok was somebody very different from Atahualpa or Montezuma. He was in charge of a very fluid coalition of uh, indigenous tribes called the Powhatan Confederation. And he wasn't a big, powerful king with taxation and tribute and a professional army. And so he was very suspicious of these English people. He wouldn't come to Jamestown. They had a plan to get him to come to Jamestown and capture him. He wouldn't come. He wanted them to come to him. So the first period in the Jamestown colony is this sort of dance between the colonists and Wahun Sunakot. They try to capture him. They try to... And the second winter... Two-thirds of the people in Jamestown starved to death. Okay? They starved to death because they didn't bother planting any crops. They didn't bother planting any food. They didn't do that. Why? Because that's not how you colonize the Americas. You colonize the Americas by 
taking over indigenous society and getting the indigenous people to do the work. You didn't work, you just lazed around. You know, this is what John Maynard, the great economist, British economist John Maynard Keynes would have called a rentier society. So this was the model that the English had, and it was explicitly derived from the Spanish. The problem with Virginia was that model didn't work in Virginia. In the same way it hadn't worked in Buenos Aires, it didn't work in Virginia. And the United States turned out to be sort of like Buenos Aires, but without the Guarani up the river. So the Virginia Company also, they weren't there to spread British culture or civilization. Or, no, 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 no. They were there to make money. It was a profit-making business, the Virginia Company. So this business of starving to death and trying to exploit the indigenous people, after a couple of years, they realized, you know, this, isn't, this really isn't working, this plan. We need a new plan. So what was the second plan? The second plan was, well, if we can't exploit the indigenous people, let's exploit the English people. Okay? So they sent out a new governor, and they passed some laws. I'm going to skip over most of these slides, but uh, here's, the, here's the laws. Okay? This is the start of the laws they wrote. And the first law is very interesting. If you read it, it says, No man or woman shall run away from the colony to the Indians upon pain of death. Now, that's a very significant law because as soon as the Virginia Company tried to exploit the English people, so they separated men and women into separate dorms, there was sort of compulsory labor, nobody got food without working, the English people ran off into the forest to live with the Indians. Okay? English people are notoriously difficult to exploit, as some of you may know. So, so they ran off into the forest. and you know, so, so it turned out to be very hard to exploit uh, the English people. One of the other reasons was when the Virginia Company decided well, we can't make a functional society here by exploiting the indigenous people. We're going to have to get more English people to come. And it was difficult to get more English people to come if you were already exploiting the ones there. So in 1619, uh, 1618, 1619, the Virginia Company did something radically different. They couldn't exploit the indigenous people because there were too few of them. They couldn't exploit the English people, so they had to come up with another idea. They decided, well, if we can't exploit them, let's try giving them incentives. So they freed everybody from their labor contracts. Most of these people were so-called indentured laborers. They freed everyone from labor contracts, and they gave everyone 50 acres of land. And they decided, let's try to get them to work by incentivizing them. And they did something else which was very radical, which also helps explain why the United States is very different from Latin America. They introduced a legislative assembly which gave men, adult males, a political power, so political rights. So they wanted to convince people that this new system is going to work. And the way they did it was by essentially giving the colonists the right to organize their own society. Okay? So if you ask me, you know, why is it that Latin America is so much more unequal uh, has a history which is much less democratic and is much poorer than North America, I'd say that has everything to do with how these early colonial societies got organized in different ways. Okay? Now you might say, gosh, but that's an awful long time ago, isn't it? He's talking about the 16th century and the 17th century. How can that possibly be relevant to today? Well, what we try to do in the book is to sort of then tell a story about how these initial conditions generate very different types of societies which reproduce themselves over time. And let me just give you two very quick examples of how that story might work. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, the Americas all faced the same types of opportunities. Uh, falling transportation costs, industrialization in Western Europe, expanding markets. Suddenly, all over the Americas, land, frontier land, uh, which had previously been not valuable, suddenly became valuable. And most societies in the Americas had to decide how to allocate this frontier land, what to do with it. Now, in the United States, the United States is a very parochial place, as some of you probably know, where you know, people think there's all this stuff about, oh, the United States is so unique, it's so different, you can't compare it to anything else. And one of the great stories about the uniqueness of the United States is the frontier, this great thing about the frontier. Uh, 
Jackson Turner, who was a Harvard uh, historian, wrote a famous book about this, about how the frontier and the expansion west into the frontier had created this very different type of society, more upwardly mobile, more democratic. It turns out that more or less every country in the Americas, with perhaps the exception of Haiti and El Salvador, had a frontier in the 19th century. Colombia had a frontier. Chile had a frontier south of the Bio Bio. Argentina had a frontier in Patagonia in the south. Guatemala had a frontier expansion into the Petén. Mexico had frontier expansion. Everyone had a frontier uh, expansion in the 19th century. So how come the Chileans you know, or the Argentines don't have a frontier myth the same way the Americans have, a, the North Americans, the gringos have a frontier myth? And that's because, not because of the presence or the absence of the frontier, but because the frontier land was allocated in very different ways. So in the United States, starting with the Northwest Ordinances in 1785, going right the way through to the Homestead Act in 1862, the United States opened up the frontier for a kind of egalitarian allocation of land. They passed laws which facilitated this homesteading. And I want to emphasize two things about those laws. One is that they passed these laws, and the other thing, which is just as important, is they, they enforced the laws. So the state was powerful enough to enforce the laws. So in Colombia, for example, in the 1870s and 1880s, liberal governments passed laws which were very similar to the Homestead Act, but of course, since it's Colombia, they couldn't actually enforce the laws. So they didn't have the same effect that the Homestead Act had in the United States. What happened in Chile when they had frontier expansion south of the Bio Bio River? Well, suddenly all of this land was taken over. Did they introduce homesteading? No, it was all auctioned off in large lots uh, to politically connected people because big landowners in the Central Valley were worried about their labor force running away and wages going up. So what you see in comparing Latin America and North America is not the presence or absence of frontier land which is significant. Actually, some Latin American countries had frontiers which were much larger relative to them, Brazil, for example, than the United States did. But what really differs is the way the frontier land gets allocated. Okay? And I think that's very significant in thinking about how these societies reproduce themselves over time. So in North America, you got this Homestead Act. Why did you get this Homestead Act? Because Political power was already, was already relatively broadly distributed in the United States. You couldn't have an oligarchic frontier expansion in a society where political rights were so broadly spread as in the United States in that period. So you had a situation where political rights were quite broadly distributed. So people forced this egalitarian allocation of frontier land that spread assets, it spread wealth evenly, and that tended to reproduce the political circumstances that gave rise to it. Whereas in 19th century, most 19th century Latin American countries, you had narrow distribution of power, a kind of oligarchic political system created an oligarchic frontier expansion, which gener generated a narrow distribution of wealth in the frontier that tended to reproduce very, the very different initial political conditions. So we use that example to sort of talk about how this unequal hierarchical society which emerged in colonial Latin America reproduced itself over time. And the, we go right the way up to uh, the last part of the chapter. We ask, how did Bill Gates make his wealth compared to Carlos Slim? So two of the richest, you know, it's... The, it's Debate, you never know who's richer than the other person because it depends on which stock market is going up or going down. But two, the two, probably the two richest people in the world, uh, Bill Gates and Carlos Slim, how did they make their money? So that's very telling, I think, about the difference between North America and South America. Bill Gates made his money by innovating. Okay? Of course, he wanted to be a monopolist. Everybody wants to be a monopolist. You know, if you read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, you know, the great you know, uh, founder of modern market economics, he talks endlessly about how people want to be monopolists. Businessmen always want to be monopolists. Academics want to be monopolists too. We want to be intellectual monopolists. But, so this is a natural impulse. But what's really interesting is how Gates made his money through innovation Carlos Slim, he's also a brilliant businessman, 
But at the end of the day, he made his money through connections, insider privatization, and creating monopolies. It's a very different way of making wealth, but it's deeply ingrained in the way things work in Latin America. The Spanish colonial system, of course, was based on an enormous number of monopolies, monopolies in all sorts of production, tobacco, gunpowder, playing cards, trade monopolies, trade restrictions, you know, and so it's very telling, that example, I think, about the nature of the economy and economic, the way the economy works in North America, and also where the incentives and opportunities are. Okay, so let me try to abstract uh, from this discussion some of the building blocks of the theory, and now I'm going to start talking about uh, Chile. So, because uh, this is obviously very stylized, and we can try to pull out of this a dichotomy, if you like, a dichotomy between North America and South America, recognizing that there's lots of shades of gray, and I'll certainly talk about that, and in fact, in talking about Chile, we want to perhaps talk more about shades of gray, because I think what's interesting about the Chilean case is that Chile both is similar and different from a kind of canonical Latin American uh, historical path. So what's the concepts we use? Well, we sort of say, well, Latin America, encomienda, forced labor, monopolies, all sorts of restrictions on opportunities and incentives, we call that an, a system of extractive economic institutions. What about North America? Well, we call that inclusive economic institutions. And where does this word inclusive come from? Let me give you a very specific example to motivate that, uh, which comes from the work of the great economic historian Ken Sokolov. And what Ken Sokolov did was he spent many, many years studying patenting records in the United States. So economic growth is fundamentally about innovation. So since the work of Robert Solo in the 1950s, economists have understood that what drives long-run economic growth is innovation, what Solo called, called total factor productivity growth, new ideas, new ways of raising production. Think about the Industrial Revolution, what started in the 18th century, all this amazing prosperity of the modern world. That was all about innovation. It was about the mechanization of cotton spinning and cotton weaving. It was about new sources of power, the steam engine. It was about new systems of transportation, roads, canals, railways, new ways of organizing production, the factory system. Innovation. So what Sokolov did was he studied innovators in 19th century US. And he did this through patenting. So when you had an idea, innovation, you can take out a patent to protect your intellectual property rights. So he studied the social background of people who took out patents in the United States in the 19th century. And what you see from that is something incredibly interesting. The same is true about the British Industrial Revolution in the 18th century. But what Sokolov showed is that people who filed patents came from kind of all over the social spectrum. Elites, non-elites, poor people, rich people, farmers, artisans, professional people. That ideas, talents, skills, creativity, energy are very broadly distributed in society. So if you want to have a prosperous society, you need a set of economic institutions, rules, that allows a society to harness all that talent, all that energy that incentivizes all those people and gives people opportunities. That was the opposite in Spanish South America or in many other countries in the world we discuss in the book which have extractive institutions that place impediments and block incentives and opportunities. Okay? Most indigenous people who were you know, trapped into these systems of coerced labor slavery, whatever, they didn't have any incentives or opportunities. Of course, talking about slavery makes you think, yeah, hold on, the US South had slavery, didn't it? So how does that make the United States so inclusive? Well, the US South was not inclusive, but the US South was poorer than the North. It had no manufacturing industry. It was far less urbanized. It had far less infrastructure, and in fact, talking about patenting data, it was actually much less innovative even in economic activities that it specialized in. But the thing to remember about the United States is that the political and economic structures of the United States developed 
before the slave economy in the South uh, came. So they were fundamentally influenced by this early period, not in the South in the slave economy, but by in Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, etc. Okay, so, so extractive and inclusive. So this word inclusive economic institutions comes from this idea of including everybody, that if you really want to have a prosperous society, what you need to have is a system of economic institutions, of rules that can incentivize the vast mass of people and give them opportunities, okay? But, but okay, that's the economics. I, th I think this is all so obvious that it's hardly even worth discussing. But what's more interesting, and you know, which is perhaps more at the heart of the book, and which is gonna be kind of crucial in talking about Chile, I think, is the politics. So why is it that some societies have extractive economic institutions and other societies have inclusive economic institutions? Is that because some economist from Harvard came and said, you know, you should really organize the things like this. You know, then things will really get moving. This is about politics, okay? The types of economic institutions and rules that you have in a society are chosen by people through the political process. So what we emphasize in the book is that it's the politics. So remember when I talked about the Homestead Act and why Chile didn't have a Homestead Act, I emphasized two aspects of that. First, the reason you got the Homestead Act in the United States was because political power was broadly distributed. So we call that, uh, this is terminology from political science, we call this pluralism, a situation where political power is broadly distributed. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story is that the United States had a state which was able to implement the Homestead Act, okay? The state was powerful and effective enough to actually implement the Homestead Act. So we use in the book, we use this phrase, political centralization. I, I think that's probably because I studied too much anthropology when I was a student. So anthropologists, especially, the, I studied a lot the social anthropology of Africa. So politic, and political anthropologists talk about political centralization. So that means like there's a state as opposed to not having a state. So, 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 so we adopted this terminology, perhaps unfortunately, but the way you should think about it is what you need to have what we call inclusive political institutions. So inclusive political institutions, we have this dichotomy, inclusive economic institutions, extractive economic institutions, lying behind that are different political systems. And what we emphasize is that to have inclusive economic institutions, you need to have inclusive political institutions. And that's made up of two things a broad distribution of political power, which we call pluralism, and a, a set, an effective central state, a powerful state, which we call, we talk about political centralization, okay? Those two things. So, with that in mind, let me try to talk about Chile, okay? So how does Chile fit into this? Well, it does and it doesn't, okay? Every Latin American country is different in its own way. Uh, and so what I'd like to try to talk about is, you know, how I think Chile is similar or different from other Latin American countries. And I'm not an expert on Chile, but I spend a lot of time in uh, Colombia. And so my way of thinking about this is very heavily influenced by, uh, by studying Colombia. And when I, when I look at the difference between Chile and Colombia, there's one thing that really sort of jumps out at me. And that's the fact that Chile has a state which works and Colombia doesn't. So Colum the state in Colombia is incapable of exercising authority in two-thirds of the country. It's incapable of building roads or infrastructure or stopping people, kidnap other people. It's in incapable of controlling violence or just doing basic things that the state is supposed to do. Colombia has huge amounts of natural resources, but the state is not able to take the rents from those resources and allocate it to socially useful things. In Chile, the state is. The fundamental you know, reason, I think, why Chile is much richer than Colombia, for example, is because it has this state which can allocate resources, it can build roads, infrastructure, provide public goods. But that's not a recent thing. That's something that goes far back into the 19th century. So, for example, the first railway that the Colombians built was in 1907, which went from Onda up the mountain to Bogota. By now, 1907, 
The Chilean, Chileans had hundreds of kilometers of railways all over the place. Okay? So this is something which goes far back. In the, by the middle of the 19th century, Chile had a postal service. There's no postal service today in Colombia. You can't post a letter to anywhere else. The government, there's no post offices. There's just, it just never existed. So, so, so this suggests to me that you need to think about the historical process that created in the 19th century a very different type of state in Chile. And I'm going to talk about that. You've already guessed, you've already seen I'm obsessed with talking about history. So, so I'm going to talk about this historical process because when I start thinking about this historical process of the state, in the formation of the state in Chile, I think it explains an enormous, to an enormous extent why Chilean politics and society looks different from Colombia or other Latin American countries. Okay, um, so I'm going to draw out some of the implications of that. So I had a slide here about how Chile is similar or different, but this will come up in the discussion. Okay, so uh, let me talk about state formation. Okay, uh, so building state institutions, building fiscal systems, building bureaucracies, raising taxes, uh, etc. Okay, uh, why is this complicated? Why doesn't everyone do this? Why is it that in Somalia, in East Africa, they don't have a functioning central state? Why is it that in the Colombia, you have tens of thousands of non-state armed actors running about narco-traficantes, you don't have roads? You know, why is that? I mean, isn't that, that should be easy to solve, right? That's a technical problem. I mean, everyone knows how to build roads. Why is it that a third of the departmental capitals in Colombia don't have running water, you know? The biggest port in Colombia, Buenaventura, has no running water or electricity. What's the problem? Don't, we, don't the Colombians know how to make water run? It's all about gravity, isn't it? Or pressure, or electricity. That's a simple technology. It's been around you know, since the 19th century. So building a state is not a technical problem. It's a political problem, okay? Because states exercise enormous power in society. That power can be used to favor some interests or groups, or it can be used to favor other interests or groups. So the fundamental reason why historically in the 19th century it was very difficult to construct a centralized state in Colombia was that Colombia was very fragmented in terms of its interests. That there were elites in Popayan, in, Popayan, in Pasto, in the south, in Cartagena, in Santa Mata, on the Caribbean coast. There were elites in Bogota. In fact, Bolivar, of course, wanted to, Bolivar, at the start, folded Colombia into this grand Colombia with Venezuela and Ecuador. So there were also elites in Quito and Caracas, and they bailed out by 1830. But it was very difficult to come to any kind of consensus about national political institutions. And in fact, the Colombians fought they still are fighting, in a sense, about that. Okay? So, so the first thing I want to emphasize is that, uh, is that building a state is a difficult, is a complicated political problem. Uh, there's different ways of thinking about that, but one way of thinking about it is that powerful elite interests have to be guaranteed. There has to be some sort of social contract amongst elites. So I think one of the reasons that this very powerful, effective central state emerged in Chile in the 19th century is that it was much easier to find this agreement amongst elites in Chile than it was in Argentina or Brazil or in Colombia or in Peru. That the elites were much more, I'm going to call, the word I'm going to use is fused, and I'm going to show you some data on this, uh, but, but this seems to be something that resonates with most Chileans that I've talked to, that the elite were concentrated in a much smaller geographical area, and they were much more intermarried, interconnected in terms of their interests, economic interests, social networks, than elites in other parts of Latin America. Okay? So, so this created... A much, a much, it created a much greater chance of having a working social contract amongst the elites, meaning an agreement to develop the state, to develop these institutions, fiscal institutions, bureaucratic institutions, that you never reached in Colombia. Uh, other things that were important. Uh, one of the problems in Colombia, for example, is that apart from the very 
fragmented elites, there was this vast periphery to be ruled. Uh, in Chile, there was no periphery like that. There sort of was, but it was all outside the country, south of the Bio Bio River. It's very much like the United States. When the United States signed the Articles of Confederation or the Constitution, of course, there were lots of indigenous people in what was to become the United States, but they were all west of the Mississippi. They weren't at the bargaining table, and there was no real discussion about how to control them, like the Mapuche south of the Bio Bio. So they were out of the territory, and that's also very significant in terms of the constitutional uh, process. The, I think also, the, I'm not going to talk about that, but you know, there was also other factors about the history. Chile had, the, you know, Chile had an advantage relative to Colombia of being peripheral during the colonial uh, period, and that generated benefits also in terms of different political and economic institutions in the late colonial period. But I want to say that I think what's very crucial is how uh, these early factors, particularly this elite homogeneity, this what I'm going to call the fused elite, created the possibility of this state. But I think it created a particular type of state, and that's what I'm going to emphasize, because I think the type of state, uh, I've talked about this already, uh, the type of state uh, was very uh, critical. So let me, I'm going to jump this and talk about what I call the catch-22 state. It, I, you know, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of academics here. So all, academics all know that you know, there's two ways to be very successful in academia. One way is to, is to take other people's ideas and pretend you had them yourself. Uh, and the other way is to come up with a piece of new terminology that no one's had before and persuade everybody else that they should start using it. So, so I've been trying that with sort of extractive and inclusive, and that's working sort of a little bit, you know, but I thought I'd go with a new, let's try something else here. And this is the concept of the catch-22 state. So what's the catch-22 state? So catch-22, this comes from Joseph Heller's uh, great novel about the Second World War, catch-22, about these... American bomber pilots in Italy, you know, so flying missions against the Germans. So this was terrible. It was traumatic. It, nobody wanted to do it. Everyone was trying to get out of flying missions. People were getting killed and, you know. So there was one surefire way to get out of flying bomber missions, and that was to be certified as insane. But that was the catch-22, because anyone who wanted to get out of flying missions, that was a rational thing. So if you wanted to get out of flying missions, you couldn't be insane. You must be rational. But the only way to get out of them was to be insane. So this was the catch-22. So what's the catch-22 here is exactly the circumstances that allowed for this precocious state formation under Portales and in the 19th century simultaneously blocked the other part of what it takes to be an inclusive society. Because the elite what I call, I'm going to call the fused elite or this elite homogeneity or elite agreement that allowed the construction of the state, but it blocked pluralism. So it blocked this other dimension that you need. So remember when I talked about what you need to be economically successful, you need to have this inclusive economic institutions. And lying behind that are these inclusive political institutions that had two dimensions. It had this state formation, political centralization, and then it had this broad distribution of political power in society. But the very circumstances that allowed for state formation made it very difficult to achieve this other dimension of inclusive political institutions. So I think that explains, and I think it explains lots of things about Chilean society and politics, as I'll sort of talk about very briefly. But I think that's the key to thinking about why Chile did very well, but then it got stuck, or it wasn't, it couldn't go the last uh, part, okay? So, and that's sort of interesting because I don't have time to talk about this, but if you think about, this is not something we talk about in the book, but we've been thinking a lot about it. In the book, we talk about these two parts of inclusive political institutions as if they were sort of independent. You know, you could have, maybe you had this or you don't have that, but these two things are actually kind of much more related, I think. But let me try to talk about uh, some of the consequences of this, okay? What are the consequences of it? Well, one consequence of this is that you know, if you have state formation, you build roads, you build infrastructure, you, you have a post office. You integrate people into a kind of this community 
into the society in a very different way. And that creates very different types of uh, politics. For example, there's a great book by Charles Tilley, who was a, a famous so political sociologist about, it's called Popular Contention in England. And what Tilley did was, Tilley studied what people complained about. So, you know, when people rioted, what did they complain about? Well, what he showed is that tracing sort of the process of state formation, they started off by complaining about the price of bread. You know, the price of bread's gone up. You know, the price of potatoes has gone up. People start rioting. But what they did over time was what they complained about changed dramatically. And instead of complaining about the price of bread, they started complaining about the system. They started complaining about the way the government worked or about how national institutions functioned. So that was that reflected the process of a very different type of society created by the extension of the modern state. If you go to Colombia today, you know, there's all this rioting and paros going on. But the paro in the Choco or in the Catatumbo or La Guajira or in Cauca, everyone has their own little parochial demands, complaints, conflicts. It's just like Tilly, the people complaining about the price of bread. There's no kind of common, no one's, you know, there's no common... There's no common interest or grievance amongst these people because the society is so fragmented that it's not unified in the way that Chile became. So if you ask me, you know, why is it that Chile has such kind of European-looking political cleavages, I think that has everything to do with state formation, how state formation created this national uh, community uh, in the 19th century. The state formation, of course, has lots of other consequences. Populism. Okay, populism. Well, Chile had populism under Ibanez in the 1950s or perhaps under, in the government of Salvador Allende. But Chilean populism looks nothing like populism. It looks nothing like Chavismo or Peronismo. It's far less clientelistic. You know, even the government of Salvador Allende, that was not about, you know, that's not like Chavismo. This was about principles. You might disagree with the principles. It was about how to organize society. It was about, this comes from this process of state formation and the creation of very different types of national political cleavages. You go back, think about civil wars, okay? The big transition in English history was between the Wars of the Roses, which ended in 1485, and the English Civil War in the 1640s and the Glorious Revolution in 1688. And what's amazing, if you look at those disputes, is that the Wars of the Roses was just a, a conflict over who was going to be in power. It was a dynastic struggle between two extended sets of families. The Civil War and the Glorious Revolution were national conflicts about how was society going to be organized. If you look at 19th century Latin America, Colombia, Peru, Venezuela, Ecuador, that, that, that the, conf the civil wars they have look just like the English War of the Roses. It was about who was going to be in power? Go back to Colombia, the 1950s, La Violencia. What was that? That was a struggle between the conservatives and liberals about who was going to be in Bogota, who was going to be in control, who was giving the contracts, who was making employment. After that ended, what did they do? They just came up with a way of dividing the pie, 50-50. We take turns for presidency. You get half the Congress. You get half the bureaucracy. We get the other half. There's no principles. It's just about, it's the war of the roses. What about Chile? Chile had one big civil war in the 19th century, in 1891. That was not about who was in power. It was not like the War of the Roses or La Violencia in Colombia in the 1950s. It was a, like the Glorious Revolution. It was about power of the executive. It was about how the institutions were going to be structured. So I think that also has everything to do with uh, state formation. So I'm talking too much. It's typical for Harvard professors. So, so I just wanted to give you some kind of flavor without talking too much about English history. I could say this fused elite. OK, I'm going to talk more about the bad side of the fused elite, and then I'll shut up. So this fused elite, how do I know the, there was a fused elite? Well, you know, here's some data from a great, wonderful book by the historian Arnold Bauer about Chilean rural society. So this, Bauer made these calculations about the proportion of politicians that were large uh, landowners in starting in the 1854 and going right through up to 1918. So this is national legislators. And the bottom line is the, is the thing to kind of focus on here. So what Bauer found, what he argues in his book, is that about 50% of national politicians uh, in Chile uh, were, 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 were big landowners. Okay? That's very different from 19th century Colombia. 19th century Colombia, politicians were lawyers, 
uh, or people who, who, were, who were basically became upwardly mobile because they were successful generals in civil wars. Very, very different uh, type of uh, politics. Uh, there's also a, a book uh, by, uh, a wonderful book by two sociologists, Racklin and Zeitlin, called Landlords and Capitalists, which, which makes a sort of similar point for the 1960s, although it's also very keen on trying to show that you know, if you thought about a stylist, stylized view of English history, you could make this distinction you know, between landlords and capitalists. And when capitalists and modern industry, mercantile activities emerged, this was a kind of separate set of people from landowners. What Zeitlin and Rackler tried to show was that this was a very kind of fused elite in the sense that there was an elite class of people who owned land, they were in business, and they were also in politics. Okay. So I won't go into that, all right? So, so my view of the Chilean development path is that, you know, Chile did very well because it had this precocious state formation in the 19th century. That explains all sorts of things about why Chile is different. It's very different from Argentina, Colombia, most other places in Latin America, Mexico included. You know, you never have any of this caudillismo in Chile. You don't have people like Porfirio Diaz or Rosas or nothing. You know, because why? Because the elite came up with this way of organizing the state, of controlling power, and it worked very successfully in many ways, you know, uh, more effective military, uh, you know, uh, in many dimensions, okay? But this oligarchic power created huge non-inclusive elements in the society, okay? And I would ask, you know, if you wanted to explain long-run comparative economic development in Chile, you have to ex try to understand how those non-inclusive aspects have inhibited the diversification of the economy, have inhibited uh, tr Chile truly becoming a very successful society, okay? Let me talk a little bit about the transition, and then I'll talk about non-inclusive institutions in Chile today, and then I'll stop. Uh, what, what do I mean by the transition? Well, here's a figure, okay? Here's uh, GDP per capita in Chile uh, relative to the United States uh, since uh, independence, okay? And what I mean by the transition is this thing here, okay? So, I mean, I could talk about this whole thing, but I haven't got time. So, uh, let me just talk about this transition here. Because this figure shows kind of dramatically this change in the development path in Chile since the mid-1980s. And I guess if you were proposing to talk about why Chile does or does not do well economically, you'd want to propose an explanation which could account for this uh, change in the development path. So according to this view of Chilean development, what could it possibly explain this transition here? And my argument is this explains it. Now, <laughs> you thought I was being simplistic. You ain't seen nothing yet. So what is this figure? Well, it's, a fig it's some data from a paper that I wrote. And the paper is about uh, the electoral reforms that Carlos Ibanez introduced in 1958 in Chile. What did Carlos Ibanez do? He introduced an effective secret ballot in elections. This, left, this, is, this picture is before Ibanez's reforms, and this is after Ibanez's reforms. On the horizontal axis is the Proportion of inquilinos, uh, you can do this in different ways, but this is the proportion of inquilinos in the uh, population in, from the 1955 agricultural census. The, horizontal, the vertical axis is right-wing vote shares at the communa level. So what this shows is that before Ibanez's reforms, the more inquilinos you had in a commune, the more the right-wing parties got votes. But after these reforms, that relationship completely disappears. Okay, so what could explain backing up this transition in the mid-1980s? Well, what could explain it in our theory is if institutions became more inclusive in some dimension, okay? And I think that's exactly what happened after Chile in 1958. How did that happen? Well, because the elites lost control of the political system, perhaps transitarily, after 1958. In, 19, in the 1960s, suddenly there was a completely different politics in Chile. There was Frey, there was Allende, there was agrarian reform. If you look at the Chilean eco economic dynamism today, what is that? It's copper, and it's this dynamic rural economy which emerged in the 1970s, 1980s. To me, you know, what's the most obvious candidate for explaining where this dynamic rural economy came from? It came from the fact that the 
trans political transition after 58 led to this enormous sh shaking up of rural uh, society. So, so that led to an enormous spread of inclusion into rural society, which hadn't existed before. The end of Inkelinaje, the end of big haciendas, a new dynamic class of people moved into the rural economy and created this rapid economic growth that you see uh, after 1985. Okay, so why did this continue? So part of this, uh, you know, uh, experience is the continuation after 1990, after the re-democratization. Well, that's not very surprising from the perspective of our theory. You know, if you take a model, if you take a, if you take a, a society where there's some elements of extraction and then you get rid of them, but then you move towards a more democratic political system, you hardly expect the extractive institutions to return. And in fact, you know, if you go back to the military and you think about what happened after the coup, you know, what happened after the coup to all of this land that was being redistributed? Well, the military essentially took the collective farms and divided up the land amongst the people who were there. A lot of the land was also sold off. So the military didn't come in and just reverse what was happening. They accepted a lot of the status quo at the time. So that led to a permanent transition in the rural economy. But this is something you'd expect to carry, keep going, once you move to more even more inclusive political institutions. So I don't think this is very difficult to kind of uh, understand at all. But then you could say, okay, but so that solved all Chile's problems? No, because I think that what the, the, that increased the growth rate because it led to far more inclusive institutions in one dimension of Chilean society. But my general sense is that this catch-22 state is still here in Chile. So how do I know that's true? Well, that's a complicated question we could spend weeks arguing about, but let me just give you a slight piece of information which is consistent with the view that the catch-22 state uh, persists. And this is just a simple exercise I did uh, looking at the social backgrounds of cabinet ministers. Now, there's lots of ways you, know, you could do this, but I want to look at not just cabinet ministers, but also economic elites. Okay, what do I mean by economic elites? Well, let's take the CEOs of the hundreds, hundred largest companies on the Chilean stock market. Now, it turns out that of those uh, CEOs, 86% of them uh, attended private schools, and of those 86%, a half of them just went to four schools. Uh, there's lots of elements of non-inclusion here. I was reading how none of these schools actually admitted women <laughs> until 10 years ago. Uh, and then one of them started admitting women, and now two uh, recently uh, have admitted women. So I haven't talked about you know, uh, that aspect of inclusion, but that turns out to be significant here. Uh, so these four schools uh, basically provide ha half of these 86% went to just four schools. Now, it turns out that if you look at the cabinet without wanting to pick on President Piñera, you know, he's the president now, so who else do I pick on, you know? So, so without wanting to pick on him particularly, uh, it turns out that 86% of his cabinet, I don't know, it's like the iron law of 86, 86% 86 of his cabinet went to private schools, and of those 86, uh, more than a half went to the same four schools, okay? Now, it turns out if you go back and you look at President Alessandri, so I didn't know who to compare this to, but I thought, well, President Alessandri, he was conservative. So, so let's go back to President Alessandri, 1958, his first cabinet. 81% of ministers attended private schools, so slightly less, interestingly enough. And of those, uh, a half came from three schools. Well, the same three schools, except this, the Tabancura, I guess, which was the Opus Dei school, didn't exist in 1958. Uh, and in the meantime, Liceo Aleman turned into sort of verbo divino, if I understand the story correctly. But what you see here is an amazing uh, persistence of kind of social networks, whereby uh, half of the cabinet and, you know, almost half of the cabinet in 1958 and today, and half of the economic, getting on for 40% of the economic elite, all went to four schools. Now, maybe, you know, this is true in, actually it's not true in Colombia, but uh, maybe it's true in other parts of the world. I'm just saying 
this is only one piece of evidence. I could talk about other evidence. Uh, it's not true about uh, uh, Salvador Allende's cabinet, of course. Uh, 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 but you know, there's some evidence here that there's very strong social elite networks connecting economic elites, uh, political elites, and I think that's very consistent with this story of the catch-22 state. Uh, I've got, I have these figures here, but let me jump over that. Okay, so, so where, do, what, where do you go from here? Well, one story I heard a lot last week uh, was, okay, fine, 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 but you know, there's, you know, we could be like Australia. We can't be like South Korea or Taiwan, but we could be like Australia or New Zealand, can't we? I mean, they're very prosperous, successful places, aren't they? They just, what does that Australia export? Iron ore, bauxite, butter, you know, lamb. Okay, fine, we can, we can be like that. You know, we've got wine and sea bass and copper, but you know, basically we can be like that. And that's great because they have per capita income, which is two, and a half, two times or two and a half times Chile. So we can keep growing and we're gonna be like Australia. I, I'm not sure about that, you know? If you think about this reform that I studied that Carlos Ibanez introduced in 1958, the Australians introduced that in 1852. In fact, it's called the Australian ballot. And it's true that Australia has this very natural resource-dominated economy, but the path from historical colonial Australia to modern Australia is radically different from the Chilean development path. Because in the 19th century, Australia was not oligarchic. Olig Australia created a state, a strong state, in the context of probably the world's most egalitarian society. So, so and that's true for New Zealand uh, also. So, there are many things which are similar about Australia, but I think uh, the catch-22 state is not one of them. So, so I, I think it's a kind of illusion to think with the current structure of Chilean society you can be like Australia, because Australia is very, very inclusive in socially and politically, and you don't have anything like what I just showed in terms of this connection between economic and political uh, elites. So, so at, at that point, let me shut up, and I think people can ask questions, can they? Yes, okay. Tenemos eh, algunos minutos para preguntas, eh, comentarios que sean cortos. Eh, así que ofrezco la palabra al profesor Robinson. Eh, vamos a juntar algunas preguntas y después le pasamos la palabra al profesor Robinson. Sí. Hola, eh, buenos días. ¿Por qué no te identifica, por favor? Yes. I can, I can also talk in English. That's not, not a problem. Uh, my name is Vicente Olavarria. I'm a freshman in this university. I've read your book. I found it fascinating. And I'm also reading Jared Diamond's Germs, no, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel for a class in this university. I have got a question for you, and I wrote it down. Um, what is your opinion on cultural materialism in general? And would you refuse Professor Diamond's alternative explanation on the origins of global inequality? Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about this. I, I mean, I think uh, uh, you know, Professor Diamond, he's a very good friend of mine, actually. We edited a book together called Natural Experiments in History. And I, I think his book is absolutely wonderful, but I think it's, it's totally wrong as, a, as an explanation at least of inequality in the modern world, you know, that, you know, this idea that somehow the prosperity of countries is determined by historical, kind of the historical uh, circumstances of the transition to agriculture and the Neolithic revolution. So his theory is about how the world was very unequally endowed with animal and crop species that could be domesticated. And so, Economically successful parts of the world are the parts of the world which had a lot of plant and animal species that could be domesticated. So 
they made the transition to agriculture early, and that transition was very productive. So population density became high, and when population density was high, you had states and technological innovation. And you know, that's, that sounds great, you know, but it predicts that Iraq should be the richest country in the world, or Jordan, or Syria. And in fact, you know, even if you just thought about Europe, and you asked, you know, where did the Neolithic Revolution start first? And where is richest? It actually works completely the wrong way round. You know, the Neolithic Revolution didn't happen in England, the British Isles, until about 4,000 BC, probably 5,000 or 6,000 years after it happened in the Levant and the Fertile Crescent. In fact, it kind of spread across uh, from... But British Isles, of course, and Western Europe, where the Neolithic Revolution came first, are actually much more prosperous, came later, are actually much more prosperous than where the Neolithic Revolution started. If you think within Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where was it the Neolithic Revolution started earlier? It was in Ethiopia, in East Africa, it was in the Sahel, uh, in parts of West Africa. The Neolithic Revolution came much later to Southern Africa. Which parts of Africa are rich and poor today? The parts in southern Africa, where the Neolithic Revolution came much later, are much richer today than Ethiopia or the Sahel, you know, Mali, Eritrea. So, so, so I, you know, just at some kind of basic factual level, it's obvious that it doesn't explain comparative prosperity in the modern world. What we could discuss more is that, you know, if we went back 500 years, is it a good, is it a good theory then? It does much better 500 years ago. But since our focus is very much on, you know, we want a historical explanation, yes, but we'd like to be able to talk about, you know, why Colombia is poorer than the United States today, I think that way of thinking about things isn't going to help us. Uh, but it's still a wonderfully inspiring book. I mean, I guess, I, I guess I, the way we try to talk about it in the book is to sort of say, you know, this is obviously not viable as a theory of inequality in the world today. 500 years ago, we could discuss, I still don't buy it, actually, but anyway... <laughs> That's a longer conversation. Anybody else? Uh, are you just preguntas? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Milena Mortegui. I am from Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> <Wonderful country. laughs> Graduate from the MBA here at Universidad de Chile. I am also nationalized Chilean, married, and um, I would like to know uh, about your perspective about the Colombian peace process, and if you think that Colombia will overcome this situation. Uh, uh, gosh, that's, a, that's an even longer discussion. I think that uh, I think it would be very good. So for probably everyone. So at the moment, the Colombian government is negotiating with the, the Marxist guerrillas in Cuba, and I think it would be a it would be a great thing if the Marxist at least one faction of the Marxist guerrillas. I think it'll be a great thing if they give up the armed struggle and you know try to take part in a democratic process of uh, creating a different sort of Colombia. But my way of thinking. The Marxist guerrillas are a symptom of Colombia's problems. They're not the problem. So the idea that if 10,000 armed Marxist guerrillas demobilize, that's going to solve Colombia's problems, I think is absolutely nuts. You know. The problems come from the way the state works and the country is governed and the way the national state relates to local elites and just you know, the whole architecture of the state, is, in my view. And... And you know, I, if you're interested in that, there's a paper on my webpage which is called Cien Años Más de Soledad, <laughs> which is a sort of characterize, which is sort of my attempt to characterize what's wrong with Colombia and the sort of the political economy of Colombia and just some of the more fundamental problems. I think some of the people involved in the peace process, like Sergio Jaramillo, for example, he kind of totally understands that. In fact, he wrote an article in El Tiempo in May saying. First we have peace, and then we have the transformation. But I think it's also it's completely obvious that there's no political constituency for such a transformation in Colombia. So I don't see very many prospects for change at all. So, but please, if you, I'm happy to talk about that. But 
If you look at my article, it's very short. Hello, um, my name is Nicolas Lillo. Uh, I'm also a student at Warwick. And uh, I wanted to ask you about, um, in your book, you talk about the decline of Venice, the, the Venetian Republic, and uh, how it once had inclusive institutions, and then it was co-opted by the elites, uh -huh. and how weak uh, the, the, the development process is. Um, I wanted to ask you about, do you see any danger of that happening in Chile, for example, or any other developing nation, middle-income country, who is working on creating these uh, inclusive institutions? I, I mean, I think, you know, I think that, um, you know, as my story that I started with about the Americas suggests, I tend to think that, you know, when, once societies get organized in a particular way, that tends to be very persistent over time and it's very difficult to change. But I think it's, you know, uh, it's clearly possible that it could change. I think, you know, we tend to emphasize different types of feedback loops that once a particular society gets moving in a particular direction, it stays there. But, the, you know, the exa some of the examples we have in the book suggest there are famous reversals in societies historically, Venice, you know, Rome or whatever. So I think it's very crucial. I mean, after all, you know, institutions are reproduced by peoples, by people's actions, their behavior, by their expectations. So, so societies can change and move in different directions, like Germany did in the early 1930s, for example, would be another great, you know, would be another great case. So, you know, many people worry about the United States at the moment, that this enormous increase in inequality in the past 25 years reflects some deepening kind of extractive element in U.S. society. I'm not sure I really kind of see that myself. I mean, I'm not an American, you know, I'm British. Uh, so, so, and I, you know, I tend to study parts of the world, you know, that makes me feel kind of optimistic about the United States. Uh, but, but, and I don't see that in Chile. I think the big picture in Chile in the last 30 or 40 years has been a huge increase in, in the inclusiveness of the society, the educational expansion, you know, I think, yes, th these elites are there, these elite schools are there, and, you know, and that's not healthy. But, but I, I would be very confident, given what I know about Chile, that actually there's a, you know, people understand these problems, they're trying to come up with solutions to them, but, but there's a, you know, the, the Chile is, you know, to me, it's the one Latin American country where you really have this very firmly consolidated, you know, inclusive aspects. Yes, there's a lot of work to be done, but I would think the society, if you looked at the big picture, the society is moving in that direction. So I ended up sounding pessimistic because I'm trying to explain why I think Chile doesn't have the GDP per capita of Australia or New Zealand or whatever, but that's not the same as a, making a forecast. So, so yes, there's always challenges to institutions and people can move off in a different direction, but, but I also think there's a lot of persistence. You know, I said here, you know, it seems, you know, my story about why Chile is different, you have to go back 200 years. You know, it's not, you can't look at the 1970s. It's not something the military did. This happened long before then. It happened, and that's the same with Colombia. You know, it's, these paths are, you know, so, 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 so I, you know, I, but I would say Chile has always been on a better path than Colombia, and I, I would say, I would say it's going to stay on a better path. Of course, you know, you could have some big shock. I mean, you could have some big, shock which would derail things and move the society in a different direction. That could certainly happen, but it doesn't seem very likely in the Chilean case. And I actually don't think it's very likely in the case of the United States uh, either. Hi, uh, my name is, is Juan Venegas. I'm a sociologist currently working in the Ministry of Education. My question is about, like, as I understood, uh, once countries are already organized, you have a chance to become richer if you change your political institutions, if you create more inclusive political institutions. In that point, my question is, what do you think about sometimes global limitations in order to improve countries, in order to, to countries to become richer? I, I'm thinking about dependency theory or the, the things that many authors say that in order to have richer countries, you have to have poor countries to support them. Yeah. I, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I mean, I think dependency theory is very interesting, but I, I don't think that's right. You know, I don't think it's right that, I mean, I think it's certainly true that, you know, if I talk, if you look, if you, you know, if you think about the British Industrial Revolution, 
or economic growth in, in, in Britain in the early modern and modern period. While Britain had very inclusive institutions internally, it was creating an empire, uh, you know, a very extractive institutions all over the world. And in fact, you know, one of the stories in our book is how, uh, how you know, uh, a lot of the poverty and inequality you see in the world was created by European uh, colonial powers. So, so, so that's sort of part of the story. And you could also say, you know, there's a famous hypothesis due to the historian Eric Williams that the British Industrial Revolution was facilitated by the profits of the slave trade, which created capital accumulation. And I think that's an interesting idea, but I don't think quantitatively it works as an explanation for the British Industrial Revolution. So I think, as a matter of fact, it's true that the British and the Belgians and the French or whoever it was and the Spanish imposed extractive institutions on large parts of the world. And, of course, British elites and people benefited enormously from that. But I don't think that was necessary. I think, in fact, Britain and those other powers would have been better off if there had been more inclusive institutions. How do I know that? Let me give you one specific example. When the British Industrial Revolution started, it was a, one of the big things was exporting. Okay? Britain started producing all this cotton cloth, and it was all, most of it was exported. Where did, it, where did they export it to? North America. If you look at British exports and you ask, where in the Americas did, who bought all this cloth? You know? Was that the Colombians or people in Jamaica? Was it the slaves who were like really well dressed? You know, it was people in North America. Why was that? Because North America was much more dynamic economically because it was much more inclusive. Now that wasn't something that the British designed. That was something, as I discussed, which just sort of happened. But but that suggests to me, you know, that things would have been much better for the British if they hadn't had all these ridiculous extractive colonies. Because actually, they, extractive colonies created really bad markets for British goods. Inclusive colonies were much better markets. So I think that, that example suggests that actually there's no real necessity, even though, yeah, that happened and uh, it, things could have been much better for the British had more colonies been inclusive rather than extractive. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Identify yourself. Ah, uh, my name is Claudio Brava, an assistant professor here at the university. First of all, I would like to thank you for your presentation. I think it was extremely interesting. Uh, and uh, I, it's uh, good news uh, uh, to see that uh, uh, you, you present a, a refreshing view of, 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 of the development of Chile during the last decades. And, uh, 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 Thinking in the future uh, of the policies that should be implemented in the country uh, and taking your idea of a more, more inclusive society uh, or more pluralistic democracy, uh, uh, what do you think should be the reforms that should be addressed in the future government in order to generate this uh, inclusive society, these inclusive institutions? I, I can come up with a several ideas, but I would like to get your, your opinion on what should be the reforms, the key reforms that should be addressed in a future government. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't have a policy agenda for Chile, and, and I'm not sure I'm an expert or know, you know, know it anything like enough of the details about the society you know, to be able to say anything sensible on that. You know, I could say one thing, since I talked about those schools, which is, I saw this wonderful film, I'm going to remember the name, Machuca, what's this film Machuca. called? Machuca, which I guess was about integrating during the government, during the UP government. It was about integrating these schools. You know, it was about trying to make these elite schools more diverse and more open to people from all over society. And, you know, I don't know if that was a successful policy. I don't know if anyone's kind of evaluated the consequences of that. That was just a movie. Uh, uh, but, but, but I guess, you know, you, you have, there's different ways you could think about making, trying to make the society more diverse, to break down barriers, to make, to kind of level the playing field. But I, I, I'm not sure I feel comfortable in telling a room of Chileans what they should do. You know, that's, this is for Chileans to figure out, not for 
Harvard professors to hold forth on. I mean, and this is not a technical issue either. It's a, it's a political issue about how the society is to be organized. And so, I'm, I mean, that sounds like I'm punting, as they say in the United <laughs> States. But, but I, don't, I don't feel very comfortable. You know, we could talk in person, but I, you know. Well, one, one final question, and we've already uh, uh, abused uh, greatly of your time. So, uh, final question, please. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Distinguished Professor Would you identify Martin, yourself? Martin Garrido, a former student from this university and this faculty too. Distinguished Professor, I have a, a little question about an historical point. You explained a few minutes ago about the Britons' influence in USA, uh, the Industrial Revolution, etc. But I remember in the time when the Victorian times transferred the culture to USA, for example, the authority, the concepts, the respect to the law, the law is the law. This culture marks a difference with Latin America. What do you think about? I'm not sure I really understood the I, question. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I did either. Um, Puede explicarlo en español y yo se la traduzco al profesor. Pues yo no lo alcancé a entender. Ah, en español. Por favor. Yeah. El, la, los tiempos victorianos transfirieron una cultura a Estados Unidos de respeto a la ley, de la autoridad. Esa cultura ha marcado la diferencia con América Latina. Uh, Victorian values of uh, respect for the law and things of that sort uh, were important in the United States. Have they been equally important in Latin America or different from, from them? I, you know, I mean, I don't talk about values very much. I think that, you know, the respect for the law, you know, that, that gets incorporated into people's preferences through a process of socialization. But, you know, I think that's really about state authority. You know, if you, you, you go back to the colonial, you know, the United States built this incredibly powerful state in the 19th century. You know, they had, by the 1850, they had a national postal service. They built railways over this enormous continent, you know, mountains, deserts, the badlands. This was an effective state that did that. Yes, they had a wild west, but they got the wild west under control very fast. How? With, through police, through implementing laws through state presence and effectiveness. So, so I tend to think that you know, obeying the law is not really about people have different values. To the extent they do, that's something which they acquire because they live in states which enforce the rules. You know, in Colombia, no one likes paying taxes. You know, uh, and, you know, but that's because there's no state that enforces tax payment. You know, there's no one, it's just, you know, it's not, I have a, I give, I give you my favorite story about values at the moment, which comes from Colombia. So I have a student from Cartago in Valle. So Cartago is a, it's in the, it's, it's the home of a famous drug cartel called the Norte del Valle drug cartel. Now, he's from Cartago. He grew up in Cartago. And he said, in Cartago, you know, nobody obeys any rules. The kids drop out of school you know, because they want to be like Los Duros, you know, the hard people, the narco-traficantes. They want to have Rolex watches and fancy cars when they're 16. And, you know, but, so they have terrible values, you could say. But when I look at that, I say, this is the problem of the state. The state is completely incapable of like, getting rid of drug running, of enforcing rules and law. And so, so, yeah, people have different values, but I guess I tend to think of them as really stemming from these institutional structures rather than, you know, there's British values or there's Spanish values or there's African values or, I mean, I, 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 you know, my, in my experience, people all over the world are very similar kind of fundamentally, but they live in very different institutional structures which creates very different incentives and opportunities for them. So they behave in different ways and often that behavior, you know, becomes part of your preferences. Like, you know, I feel I feel guilty not paying taxes in Colombia, even though there's no chance that anyone's going to come and sanction me. Why do I do, why don't, I mean, Colombia, why, that, why, don't, why do I bother, you know? But because, because, you know, because I'm socialized into paying taxes, it's pathetic, but it's true.
<risa> este, este funciona. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful oh. lecture. We really enjoyed it, <laughs> learned a lot, and as a uh, remembrance of your presence here, I'd like to give you a little gift. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Have a Thank you. Thank you. Gracias a todos por venir y hasta pronto.